Hey everybody, Action Movie Dad here, and I wanted to introduce you to our newest tutorial on turning your floor into lava. Now, uh, this is one of my favorite videos, and I really like how it turned out, and I actually had the opportunity to be doing another version of this video for a little short that we're doing with EvanTube HD. So, I thought I would take the opportunity to kind of record that process and demonstrate to you guys what I do to turn the floor into lava. Hopefully you guys can do the same. Now, obviously your footage is going to be different than my footage. This footage for the new short is different than my original one that I did with James. So, we're going to jump into this with a few things in mind. The first step in doing this is tracking the footage. Once the footage is tracked, you establish a ground plane where the lava is going to go, and then you figure out what you need to erase of your existing floor so you can replace it with lava. So, I'm going to be tracking the footage, then isolating the foreground, including the pillows and characters, and then I'm going to be working on the creation of lava and compositing it in to create a convincing little landscape. So, we'll be going through those three steps. I'll probably jump around a lot. Uh, I don't organize these very well, and I just kind of go for it. So, without further ado, here is The Floor is Lava. Anyway, I'm going to try to do this quickly, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, you'll see one of the things that I did in this particular setup was I put some red wrapping paper and cloth on the floor here. Now, the reason I did that was because the hardest part about these is hand rotoing anything where the kids need to be in front of the newly created floor. So I've thrown this red background here. Dumbly, I have James wearing a red shirt. It was a last minute choice because uh, the shirt he was wearing got dirty. If you're going to do this yourself, I would highly suggest using a carpet or a piece of cloth or something like that that is pretty different in color from the kids that you're working with just so you don't have to spend all of your time rotoing. Anyway, here's my first piece of footage. I've loaded it into its own composition, and I'm going to run the Foundry's camera tracker on it. Uh, now, I'm sure that the After Effects tracker is just fine in the newer versions of After Effects. I'm actually on Creative Cloud 2014, but I love my old habits, and I always keep on coming back to my 5.5, which still has all of my plugins nicely organized, and I just really haven't spent the time to get myself uh, set up in the new one. So the default settings here are pretty good. Um, this is a pretty high quality camera, everything is pretty sharp, and I don't think the movement is too dramatic, so I'm going to go ahead and try tracking it with these basic features. I might increase the number of features to 300, um, but I'm just going to run it by itself. After it completes itself going forward, the tracker actually runs backwards so it can double check on any vectors it was kind of predicting and was wrong on. Alrighty, once that process completes, you can come over here and I'm going to scroll through this a little bit and kind of look down at my frame counter because this ending point is a really great reference frame for everything. And in fact, this camera tracker has a reference frame. Um, setting under its solve function. So I'm going to go ahead and say set a reference frame, look at frame 671 when you're solving this to know that everything should look like this. This is the basis for where you want all of your geometry to be fitting in, ignoring the kids pretty much. So solve the camera. So I've run a solve and I've got an error of 1.97 pixels, which is pretty good, uh, especially for this type of video. You aim for something as close to a pixel or less than a pixel as you can get. Um, this one, I think, two pixels of error is just fine. Now that the process has been solved, I can say create a scene. And what that does is it will create these layers, a camera, and it'll create a null that it kind of considers the center of its universe right now. But I'm going to change that to somewhere else. Uh, I can highlight a different point and say ground plane set origin here. And that will make it so this null, which the camera is parented to, is sort of the center of everything. So I believe as I scrub through here, 
that point should stay pretty married to that couch. One thing I've got to watch for is when the kids run through it to make sure it doesn't get displaced by them. And it looks like it does a pretty good job. It looks like it's locking to that point just in front of the couch. It's a little bit off here, but not too bad. Great. Now I'm going to look for two other points on the floor in this tracking data. It looks like this would be another good one, the other side of the couch. And I'm going to create a null object there. I'm going to come over here and maybe create a null object there. What I'm doing is I'm highlighting this X, then pressing Control and clicking on it. Create a null object, and there you go. And you can probably do all of this type of tracking in the After Effects uh, CC2014 tracker and get some similar results and a similar way to define a plane. This is a teeny bit more tedious, but it's not too bad. Um, I'm going to create a composition that is, I'm going to say, maybe 2k by 2k for now. And I'm going to call it the ground. Now in here I'll go ahead and create a solid and throw a checkerboard effect on it. The reason I'm doing that is I want to have something that I can slide let's see I'm adjusting the width here something that I can throw into this piece of footage and kind of map it to the, be this new ground plane. So I'm going to drag in the ground here. I'm going to turn it 3D. It'll put its origin right here on the this first null object, which is the center. Um, one of the things I find I need to do with a camera tracker often is I take the original null and I change its scale to a much higher number. So for example, I'm going to change this from 100 to 1000. And what that does now is now 2K is kind of this distance across my background real estate. Uh, it looks like I don't need that much. I'll maybe I'll try 500. And this feels a little bit better. That means that when you drag in objects, um, their true resolution will fit kind of within the frame as opposed to always coming in large and having to scale them down. Plus, you can have a little bit more fine tuning with moving things around when objects are a teeny bit smaller. So I've dragged in this ground plane, turned it 3D, and that means it's married right to this origin point. So if I kind of scrub through, you'll see that it's this 3D object that is locked there. But obviously it's kind of in this weird orientation. And the way I'm going to lock it more to the ground is, first of all, I can just move to here, take the rotation controls, and kind of lay it down until it feels like it's kind of matching to me. I want to sort of align it to the geometry of the room where the couch is sort of a line and the background is sort of a vector. And I'll start off there and kind of play through, see what that looks like. It looks like that's getting a little bit more promising, which is nice. Uh, I've created these null objects a little while ago, as you'll recall. So if I hide my footage and change the background to black for now, and I switch using the F11 key, um, or there's this little drop box right here to uh, go to a custom view. I can see these three null points, the original that's the center of the world, and these two other ones that I created. In this space, I'm very, I can very easily rotate around to see if my ground plane that I just created is lining up with all of those points. Right now it's not really. Uh, you'll see that it's dipping down low here and going high there. So the quick way to resolve this is to kind of find an angle where you would see that you're kind of flush with the ground where this null, that null, and that null line up. And now I can take the ground and just tweak its rotation just that last little bit to try to put it in, to try to align it with these other points. So that's a very fuzzy way to do this. Um, I think that CC 2014 actually has something better for this. Um, but for now, this is how I'm going to deal with it. So if I switch back to my main view, turn on the footage again, and just rotate the Z only in here, I should see that this plane looks really married to the ground plane now. So I'll play that second half through, and you can see that these, this grid is pretty aligned and locked to the floor. So the next thing to do is kind of adjust this whole ground plane to really fit 
the size of what my final framing is. It can be a little bit smaller this way. It can slide toward us a little bit. Um, if it's right about here, I do want it to be able to extend a little bit past the borders of where it needs to be in the frame. But I don't need it to, but I would like it to fit pretty closely. So looking here, I feel pretty confident about that. Excellent. Now that that work's taken care of, uh, I can start to create a lava texture that I'm going to throw onto it. So this ground pre-composition that I created had that checkerboard pattern in it. I don't need that anymore. I could leave it in if I want in case I need to turn it back on later. But for now I'll create a new solid. and I'm going to go generate some, or actually I'm going to go to noise, fractal noise. Uh, Arn Rabinowitz does a great tutorial on fractal noise on Creative Cow, I think. It may have been ported over to Red Giant, but those are both very worth looking at. It teaches you a lot about this really powerful plugin. I use it as a basis for anything organic I need to do. Um, you'll see what fractal noise is, is basically a, generating, a generated um, bit of fractals repeating over and over themselves to create this cool noise pattern. You have these controls over brightness, contrast, the complexity of the fractals, how small they get. You can see as you dial it up, you get these really fine, teeny details, even when really zoomed in if you want. Um, there are several types of noise. There's a soft linear, there's a block, which is kind of cool for doing digital effect things. Um, linear, uh, this soft linear I think is the default and it's what I'm going to use to create my lava flow. So right now what I kind of have is these bright white areas with these black little islands. I'm going to turn up the contrast so the black islands look a little bit more like that. And then I'm going to add a color correction toner effect to this. What I'm going to do in here is I'm going to change the toner colors to be kind of in this red-orange realm. So this can be kind of a dark red down here. And I'm going to change the white to be pretty much leaning toward orange, but still pretty red. I've heard my lava was a little bit too yellow the first time around, so I'm trying to get it more like that. And we're going to add some glow effects on top of it, so you really just want this to be a good base lava pattern. Um, that's looking pretty cool to me, and you'll see what happens when I jump right back over. The lava is now kind of on the floor, and you have a basis for what you want, which is pretty cool. But we want to add a little bit of life to this, so one of the ways you can add life is by adding keyframes to the evolution. You'll see that the evolution cycles through random fractal input, and it just outputs these really cool shapes. And in fact, if you wanted to, you could just animate the evolution, but I'm going to try to add a little bit of a flow too. So under transform there's also a an offset control here that I'm going to put a keyframe on. So if I reveal my keyframes by pressing U, you'll see that I can put this keyframe way at the beginning and then way by the end maybe I'll say that I want this lava to like flow down this far. And during that whole course, I also want to set the evolution keyframe, one at the beginning. And then by the end, as it flows down, I'm going to have it kind of evolve just a little bit. So there we go. So now as I play through this, it's 17 seconds long, so it's going to take a moment. But the idea is this very slow drift and there's a little bit of changing around in there. So it's kind of neat. Now, one of the other things that I can add on top of this just to add a little bit more of a flowy feel is distort turbulent displace. Now that immediately adds this kind of like twisted, kind of cool look to this all. Um, turbulent displace also uses an overlaid fractal um, and you'll see that the more I turn up the uh, amount, you can kind of really see the revealed distortion effect, which is pretty cool. Um, 
I just want this to be subtle. I just want it to kind of knock this off of square a little bit, kind of like this, where you feel like there's a little bit of liquid something happening. Now, I can adjust these keyframes as well. So I'm going to set the size of this distortion field to be a little bit smaller because it's going to be kind of small in frame at point. So, and then I'm going to set a uh, keyframe for the evolution in here because again this uses a fractal and you can evolve through different inputs to the fractal string. So we'll go ahead and say um, over the course of this you should evolve like maybe let's rotate a couple times and now I'm going to go ahead and preview that so as I play through this you see this subtle little bit of shifting and rolling in these little lava bits and what that'll hopefully look like in the end is just you know that lava flow kind of feel so we'll start here. This is a really simple basis. We can tweak it, try to make it look more realistic or overlay other stuff if we want, but this is the general idea, and I think that it'll serve as a good basis for our lava flow here. And just a bit of housekeeping, I'm going to run a script that I made called Create Folders. It's really simple. It just creates these five folders that I often use, or six folders that I often use to do this kind of work. Uh, or I can take my stuff, I'll put these into the footage element because the footage comes from here. Um, and I should rename this comp to be something like, uh, this is shot 11 in the uh, little short that we're doing. So I'm gonna call it 11 lava one. I put that in my comps. I'm gonna put the ground under pre-comps. That way everything is a little bit more tidy and I can know right where to go for the things that I need. Anyway, uh, if we go into here, now you can see the floor lava. But obviously the problem is these kids and the pillows and everything should be on top of the lava. So we're gonna to have to work with that. I'm gonna turn this to semi-opaque for a moment so I can remember that it's there, but I can see what kind of keying work I have in front of me. Now, here's something that I learned the hard way. Uh, any layer that you have the camera tracker on has a ton of keyframes and really adds to the data of your project file. It takes it longer to load and longer to save because of it. So, technically, once all of this stuff is applied to the camera, you don't really need it anymore, but I will often use it so I can grab, you know, where one of these points is and add a null object there. So I'm leaving it for now, but if you ever need a duplicate of your footage, which I was going to do right now, uh, don't duplicate this one without deleting that effect. Or, more sensibly, bring it back in from an outside source and then always use the copy that doesn't have the footage on there, or it'll slow you down. So. Like I said, I was hoping that part of this would be solved by keying. And in fact, I'm going to try that now. Go to a good middle of the road frame where all the kids are in front of it. Um, I'm ignoring his shirt now because obviously that was a bad idea. So I'm gonna try a key light effect and I'm going to see what happens if it grabs this red. Um, the ground obviously is supposed to be a little bit red anyway, so if I turn that back up, um, you'll see that what's happened is it's put the lava nicely in that red section of floor and through James' shirt pretty well. So that's kind of cool. And again, you can kind of ignore the color. We're going to play with it a little bit later. I'm really concerned more with the tracking of, and keying of everything. So. This kind of works for part of it. It gets this whole back section of floor kind of nicely keyed. You see a little bit of stuff bleeding through. I'm going to tweak the settings on here. And really what I want in the end is just a nice hole wherever the lava is. So obviously parts of Evan are keying better than others because there's a little bit of red in the skin and uh, there's a little bit of bleed and stuff. So may need to play with that a little bit more to get it refined. 
try starting there, and I'm going to try a few tricks. I'm going to add a simple choker, which chokes things backwards about a pixel. What that does is that anything that was semi-transparent, it just makes it more opaque for the moment. And then I can use a matte choker on top of that, which has more refined controls, like softening and things like that. Um, but it's on top of those pixels being knocked to opaque. So the color is very off now. So really what this layer becomes is a good alpha channel source for um, a matte later. So right now, everything except for James' shirt in that top section is pretty well cut out to reveal this lava. And that's great. Looks like our kid Evan here looks pretty good on front, in front of it. Um, there's going to be some glow and things that I add later, so I'm not really that concerned with the edges being super fine. But this is what I was really hoping for, was this section that was originally covered in red stuff gets covered by lava. Great. So now I need to punch out these other sections, um, this carpet, this boring stuff. Luckily, the kids don't move independently in front of that very much, except for right here. And it's not a big deal. I'm going to have to do some hand masking, but um, it'll work all right. So we'll start with this broad left side of the frame. So I'm going to create a new uh, solid. I'm going to actually make it 2K by 2K as well. I'm going to call it the uh, Floor Puncher. It's a cool name. Um, we're going to use the position, scale, and rotation value of this 3D object. Uh, the way I revealed those was P, S, and R. Um, if you press that when um, highlighting any object, you can see position reveals its position, rotation reveals its rotation, R, that is, reveals the rotation, S reveals the scale, and if you hold down shift as you additionally click keys, it reveals just the properties you want. Nice little shortcut. So I've highlighted the position scale, orientation, copying those, I'm pasting them to my floor puncher layer. That means that it's pretty married to the ground, so if I like, I can now kind of come to this ending section here, and I'm going to draw a shape on it. I'm just going to say draw this pillow. Now I know the pillow isn't flush with the technical ground plane, but it will move kind of similarly to the ground. So now that I've drawn a... I'm going to turn off this top layer so there's no confusion here. Um, What's going to happen now is if I look at just this new layer where I've drawn this black around this pillow, it's really a mask drawing on this solid that is projected onto the floor. So as I scroll through, it's going to react to most of the same camera movements. And therefore, really, unless the camera changes enough to prospectively push the pillow into a different place, I don't need to go and set a keyframe every frame. I could actually just set a small handful of keyframes for when this mask looks appropriately like it's covering this pillow and when it's not. So you'll see I'll set a keyframe there. If I scroll through the whole rest of it, this mask holds up pretty well. I can adjust it by a few little pixels here and there just to cover it up, but that's pretty good. Um, this whole process is to, let's see, if I scrub to here, I can see that when he's stepping on the pillow and when the camera moves all the way back, there's more of the pillow out here in the foreground. So I'm just going to adjust my mask slightly here, slightly there. Um, the whole goal of this is to create nice masks so you can put these pillows and everything back on top. And ultimately, I'll probably pre-comp everything down so I just have one clean layer that has the floor missing. So bend that down because of this foot issue right there. I'm going to scroll around this a little bit. 
looks like right in this one section where the kids are jumping on the pillow it's going to need a little bit more love but um, again this is relatively few keyframes for the total number of frames and that's always a good ratio I like to strive for using tracking data to help me minimize that wherever I can so basically I just need to step through and anytime there's a little adjustment kind of tweak the mask points a little bit but it's really not that bad you just kind of keep stepping through it it's just like any roto process really this changes every time they step on it so so there's pillow number one taken care of I'm gonna do the same thing to the other ones I may not bore you with the full uh, viewing of my tracking I might paraphrase that so here we go on the same layer I'm gonna create more masks for these other pillows let's go to the beginning or go to the end these pillows I just need the bottom edge keyed for so really this is all I need now another way I could be accomplishing this is using the roto brush the roto brush is pretty good for well filmed things and it would be a reasonable thing to try in this case but I'm kind of enjoying this and I also think that it'll be a teeny bit less work because with a roto brush you really do have to peek at every frame um, with this sort of projection style guesstimation I don't really so a little bit of a trade-off whichever you prefer to do roto brush could be super accurate and get this all done uh, sometimes I'm a little bit more concerned with my speed than um, the perfect look of something because most people will see this one time like it or not so I just need to make it just good enough you can take that to the bank do work that is just good enough all right since I was mentioning it I'll go ahead and use the roto brush for this pillow right here this third one that I haven't done yet um, best way to do that I need a copy of the footage uh, one without all the effects on it I'm just gonna drag in a new one I'm gonna start its boundaries here because that pillow isn't visible until here and then it's visible all the way through the end um, I'll start right here Actually, I'm going to start a little bit farther in. Start right here. I'm going to go to make sure that my resolution is on full. That's the very first thing you should do whenever you use the roto brush is double check that. I'll double check my layer. And now I'm going to go to the roto brush tool up here. So check this out. So it very well gets that pillow. And likely as I play this through, it'll probably grab it pretty well. Um, I'm going to back through this a little bit and let it get these first few frames of the pillow. And I'm not doing anything here, I'm just stepping back through the frames and letting the roto brush do its thing. This is a nice bright white contrasty shape so it's having almost no trouble. I'm going to expand the boundaries of the area that the roto brush is willing to sample. Let's step back. and it did a great job. Uh, really all I need is this bottom edge of the pillow because the top edge keyed out with a color keyer. So I'm gonna start playing through this and just watching this bottom edge and making sure it stays good as I go through. Uh, now that I'm to this part, I can actually just play forward and just keep an eye on it. Looking good. It's getting the bottom of the pillow, which I said is my main goal here and it's getting a little messy just right there for a second um, to undo that little bit of frame I'm going to start stepping through now because we're going to start to lose stuff um, I do actually want to grab James legs since they go a little bit in front of the lava here anyway so I'll go ahead and add that to the mix why not uh, I want his legs, but I don't want that carpet. Uh, that pillow, I think, is already tracked, so I'm going to leave that be. Um, his jeans have a little bit of outcropping in front of the carpet. I'm going to shave that back in. And I'm going to have to use the roto brush probably to go do James' uh, shirt later. I'm going to turn the smoothness up on this. 
over here in the uh, effect controls panel. Uh, that's a little bit much. Maybe it's back to there. Just to get rid of all those jaggy edges. Oh, a little bit of lava should be there. That's doing well. It's doing well. Now I'm holding down Alt to remove sections from the Roto Brush selection. If you're not familiar with the Roto Brush, it's very worth watching a tutorial that is specifically designed to help you with the Roto Brush. I'm going to kind of breeze through this. If you really wish you could see more of your kids, just rotoscope a shot with them. You'll see lots and lots of them. So what I'm going to do is mix and match the alphas that I'm getting both using this red screen punch out and my hand keyed footage to kind of combine them and to make something that hopefully represents the whole image together. But I'm going to go ahead and jump into the James shirt thing now. You guys can watch and you can hopefully learn not to make this same mistake. So it ends up being four seconds of material that I need to worry about a short for, so not bad in the grand scheme of things. Let's begin. I'm going to use a roto brush for this, smoothing it out a little bit, just framing through. I seem to recall that his arm was disappearing here too, so I think I need to grab his arm. So you can see there on the bottom of the screen, this is time-lapsed. Uh, this is 10 minutes of work. And now I am freezing the roto brush section for James shirt. It was obviously a little bit sloppy, but that's because I know a lot of these edges are going right into some of the other stuff that I have keyed and going on already. So at this stage, I'm going to go ahead and output what is basically the top layer of Evan and James with a transparent floor. I'm going to render it as a PNG sequence with an alpha channel. We'll go ahead and call it foreground and I'm going to time lapse through this render probably so now that that's rendered out I can go ahead and grab the PNG sequence of this alpha I'm going to create a separate uh, pre-comp where I apply this to the original footage. Um, and the reason I'm doing that is because I would like it to serve as an alpha mat. So apologies, I had to take a little pause in working on this video, but we're back. And uh, the most recent thing I did was export a PNG sequence that had the alpha, um, basically the cutout floor of this piece of footage. So what I've done now is I just made a little pre-comp where I am applying that PNG sequence as an alpha mat to the original footage. The reason I'm doing that is because there's a little bit of discoloration in that PNG sequence because of some of the keying effects. But uh, when I bring them back in and apply them to the mat, I have a temp uh, purple solid. I'll turn that into a guide layer for now. Um, but yeah, as you scroll through, you can see that now the floor has been replaced mostly by this purple stuff. Purple stuff. Purple stuff. Purple stuff. So I did a little bit of spot cleanup in here. There were just a couple little areas where there was occasionally a hole or something, and I just did a few quick uh, masks to cover up any of those little bits. So now that that's all done, I have this great pre-comp called 
FG for ground. Uh, that will basically be all of this stuff that I can use. So now if I go back to my comp that had the original camera tracking in it, almost all of these layers were in here just to help cut out pieces. And they're a little bit time intensive, and now I have this great foreground comp that has all that same information, but it's already done for me. So basically I can turn off all of these and just keep my ground plane, my camera, and I'll keep that uh, null that the camera's attached to just so all my spatial stuff stays the same. But uh, what I could do is just turn off all of these. I don't need their sound. And I'm going to lock them now. Um, maybe I'll color code them all, something boring. Dark green, lock them. And the other thing I could do, just so I don't have to deal with them later, is hide them all using the shy switch. There we go. And now I have this really tidy uh, comp that just has my background footage, that ground plane we were working with, and now I can drag in my foreground element and put it right on top. There we go. So now as I preview, we're kind of on our way. I've got this foreground layer in front of my nicely tracked lava plane, which is pretty great. So now I can start to spend a little bit of time really focusing on the look of the lava. Now the lava I had originally started with was really just kind of red and black, um, and I want to have a few more highlight areas in it, so I'm adding in some yellow into that toner effect and uh, making sure the mid-ranges look kind of red. And then as I adjust the brightness and contrast of the fractal noise, I can kind of get to this level where I'm really liking the mix of uh, black floating rock on top of the generally red but with a few yellow highlight lava. Um, I had added in a little bit of a drift animation in it originally and you can see in the playback that right now it's drifting from left to right kind of and that looks a little bit bizarre the whole time to me just because it feels like it's drifting but none of the furniture or anything is drifting so I might get rid of that. I may change it so it's a flow from over here in the fireplace direction this way, but right now it's flowing a bad direction for me. It looks like in my pre-comp that flow is moving downward the whole time. Um, and one simple thing I could do just right now is go to my ground plane and rotate it 90 degrees. I'm holding down shift so it snaps to just a 90 degree rotation from where it was. And what that should do is it should make it so that flow is coming a little bit toward camera. And that looks a little bit better. It doesn't make it feel like the tracking is messed up, it just feels a little bit more dynamic and coming toward us, which is kind of cool. So I'm going to go with that for now. Uh, in this ground plane, I'm really loving this look of the lava, and as a refresher, it really is just this one layer with a fractal noise on it, um, a toner effect on it that converts it to these lava-like colors, and a little bit of turbulent displace, all which have a few keyframes throughout to offset the noise to make it look like it's drifting, some evolution on the noise so the like the black patterns and these yellow patterns are all going to be kind of changing subtly over time, not too much but just a little bit, and then that turbulent displace to give that kind of rolling liquidy effect so parts of it are moving faster, parts are moving slower. So I'm liking all of this stuff. Now I may have mentioned that I always have my autosave settings on at five minutes. Um, it's a little bit often and it's a little bit disruptive to the workflow, but there's a lot that can happen in five minutes when you're in After Effects. You might lose a cool setting or something like that. So I have it set as minimally as I can without um, driving myself crazy. Great, now that I have the ground and the foreground in here, I'm going to try to add kind of a glow effect coming from this lava. So one of the great things I can do is I'm going to go to the foreground and I'm going to use some light wrap. Um, it's in key correct. I think this is a, um, this may have come with the key light suite or the primat keying suite, um, light wrap effect. Um, and what that'll do is if I set the background layer to be the ground plane, and I turn this up. Uh, I'll turn the width up so you can see what's happening. It's adding this uh, kind of wrap around the characters and around the bottom of the couch and everything. 
If I turn up the brightness, you'll really be able to see it. Um, so I basically just adds this little thing around them, which is kind of silly. Now, right now, the ground plane is a 3D layer, so it's actually not properly getting wrapped to the characters where it is in space. It's imagining that the ground is set flat and behind them and wrapping color around that way. Now, normally, I would have to pre-comp the ground plane so it would be a one-to-one -one match for the screen resolution so the correct color will wrap around. But really, all of it is pretty much just this red color, so I'm not going to really worry about that. I'm going to turn it back down to make the comp mode add. You'll see it's starting to add this little red glow in front of some of the characters, which is nice. Um, I can blur the background so it's blending all of that red together. Um, you'll see when I turn this on and off that it's adding this little bit of glow here and there. And that's great. Um, the next thing I can do is I'm going to make a duplicate of this ground layer. Move it up to the top just so you can see this whole area here. And if I convert this to a adjustment layer, what happens is it's still this 3D layer, but it becomes invisible because right now it's just an invisible 3D uh, adjustment layer. I'm going to scale it up a little bit, and then on it I'm going to generate a glow, or I'm going to stylize glow. And this is kind of fun. It's going to make it so all of this stuff can have a cool glow effect to it. I'm going to turn up the radius of the glow so you can just see the that red bleeding out over everything a little bit. So this glow is kind of neat and it's right here kind of coming from this plane which is nice because that means it'll track through and just glow where I want it to. Um, it's obviously grabbing the couches and the pillows and making them look crazy hot. So I don't need that. So I'm going to try doing this. I'm going to go to kind of one of my mid-ground framings where I can just draw right on it the areas that I really want the glow to be happening. And now I can just feather that out a bunch. And now you get this little bit of glow back there some glow throughout and obviously that mask shape wasn't very precise but you'll see that it kind of tracks through in a 3D way which is kind of nice it just adds a little bit of glow and hot stuff around that pillow some of these other areas and if I wanted to I could even have that mask path kind of change throughout so looks like I set it originally around here so I can leave that key in that vicinity and then go to the end of it and adjust the mask to expand to more places. I'm still trying to avoid, avoid these pillows because it makes them look like they're uh, heavenly bodies or something like that but I'll keep it kind of tight to the bottom of the couch and doing some other stuff like that and then one thing I think that'll help this overall scene it's getting a little bit hot where these pillows are these couches are white, so everything looks a little bit too bright and happy up here, but so hot down here that I'm going to add an adjustment layer from the top. I'm going to turn this into a 3D layer. I'm going to click my toggle mode so I can switch to 3D. It's going to align it, if you'll recall, with that bottom corner of that couch. Um, I'm going to rotate it and bring it forward in space so it's sort of this adjustment layer that's sort of aligned with the middle of the room. Uh, you'll see as I scroll through now, this 3D adjustment layer sort of has its roots right in the middle of the room and kind of keeps itself there, which is nice. So that means that if I make it a little bit extra big, I can say uh, color correction. Let's use the toner here again. I'm going to go ahead and steal the toner from my ground plane way back here. Highlight that, copy the colors, bring it back in, and paste them on here. It gives the whole room this terrible red look.
Now I don't need all of that red, I can just have it blend in with the original a little bit. So I'm going to blend it in so my whole room is turning to this red color. Only about that much. And then the reason I made that 3D is so I can add a mask here. And now I can feather this mask. And what this is going to allow me to do is the whole room will have sort of this red glow going upward. I'm going to adjust these toner values a little bit. They're doing different things than I thought they would do. And really, I just want the color correction to be happening on the furniture. So I'm going to take the foreground, make a duplicate of it. I can kill its light wrap shape. Um, and then use it as a mat for this adjustment layer, I believe. Alpha mat. Nope, that didn't work. I suppose I can always do this. I'll bring this adjustment layer down under the foreground layer. Hmm. So what I have now is this 3D adjustment layer that is kind of turning the room red up at the top. Obviously the room is really bright and I don't want it to. And this is kind of a weird looking result here. So I'm going to tweak the settings on this toner right now. Um, I'm going to change this to have no track matte. Um, it looks like we might need some brightness and contrast or something to happen before whatever this toner is doing. I'm going to adjust this mask because it's affecting the ground too much and not affecting the rest of the room as much as I wanted it to. So we'll do that. We'll turn on this toner. It gives everything this red glow. Um, I'll throw in some contrast of sorts afterward. Blend a little bit more with the room. Make this darker. Now here's where if you see me do something really weird, it's because I'm colorblind. I'll probably have my wife check on this effect before I release it, but when I'm playing around, I just use the best guess I can do based on these numeric handy numeric values up here. Alright, so because this room is really bright, the white makes this kind of ugly color going on right here, but at least the whole room does look a little bit more tinted to look like it's uh, turning red. So I've got this glow on the ground, which I'm going to turn down a little bit. Don't need it to be that hot, just a little bit. Um, got this adjustment layer that's floating in 3D space that tints the whole room red by the end. And what I'd really like that to do is sort of fade on as this thing goes on, because usually the joke is that the room is kind of normal before you see the lava. So I'll turn that all the way back down zero. And now as you play through, let me make sure, great. So now as we play through our video, um, it'll be kind of a color correction that's being actively applied to the room as we zoom out. So we're in what looks like a normal suburban house setting. Then as we get to pull back here, the room will slowly start to get tinted. It's a little bit of a production design, art direction change, and a little bit of it could look kind of like a camera trying to grapple with all the red being cast up from the floor. So hopefully if I've, if I've timed the uh, ramp well, as we get to around here, the room should be starting to transform red. So 
Looks like I could pull my second key up to be a lot sooner than it is right now. Because I feel like by the time we're out of here, the room could be turning a little more red. There we go. So doing my best to combat this bright white light. It's kind of weird. I, I really have no idea what would happen with lighting if this was a real lava and that was a bright window next to it. So we're just going to guess that this is OK. Um, one thing you could always do is, if I had a duplicate of my ground plane, I can generate a ramp on top of it. That's going to kill everything. Um, but I could tr put a ramp here by the window to kind of be adding this glow to the room. Adjust that so it looks like the couch is sort of making a little bit of a shadow into the room. And now I can apply this as an overlay. Uh, maybe is it just a multiply? Nope. How about a slight screen? That's interesting. I kind of like what's going on here. Um, I'm going to make that a little bit more subtle and use it a little bit. So now if I turn that up a teeny bit, it's going to brighten this side of the screen just a little bit. And I should maybe make the end color be something like yellow instead of white. That's interesting. It makes it so it feels like this side of the lava is maybe getting some light from outside. I know that I have I don't really know what would happen if you hit lava with a bright light because parts of it are almost stone and parts of it are their own glowing plasma. But I actually think that this effect is helpful somewhat because it brightens the side of the room, which makes this window section a little bit more forgiving so you don't have that hard line right here. I'm going to leave that. I like it. So now we've still got a little bit of this weird color correction going on there. I'll probably need to double check with my wife because I have no idea what is happening here. Um, turn this down a little bit. Turn this to red maybe. So a little bit of funkiness on there, mostly because I think these couches are so bright white they're really hard to wrap anything else on top of in terms of a color correction without making them look a little bit silly. I don't know what would happen if I brought the highlight roof down a little bit to the red. Kind of the orange realm. I'm still combating the light, natural light from this window, which maybe what I could do is just this mask from the beginning should kind of exclude what's getting hit by the natural light and just focus on hitting and affecting all of the couch and stuff over here. That could work if that were set to something less than 100%. Okay, let's turn this up just a little bit. So at its height, it's doing that. I can live with that. It's kind of an interesting effect. It's turning this stuff a little bit yellow, kind of red. Um, I'm going to blend it in with itself a little bit more. And all of this is trial and error. I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah, I hate the way it looks here now, so. Boy, am I having trouble solving this one. I think that around here we're in an okay spot. Because you still get the idea that there's some light affecting the side of the room. This is a bright red hot lava floor. And now all that we're missing is some kind of interactive effects. Some heat ripples and some cool fire. Let's start with the heat ripples. The heat ripples I'm going to do in a very similar way to this glow adjustment layer. In fact, I'm just going to duplicate that adjustment layer. I'm going to kill 
the effects on it. I'm going to add a distortion. Um, turbulent displace. Now immediately that does kind of what we want. It's distorting and wobbling everything a little bit. Uh, the opacity on this has a ramp on it right now. I'm going to kill that and turn it to 100% the whole time. Now because of these feathered uh, walls you're getting a double image in some of these spots. I want to minimize that so I'm going to turn down the feathering on this so it really is just this one specific area within this mask is getting hit by this wobbly turbulent displace effect. Now right now the default settings make this very big, this effect, but I'm going to change the size of it down to something like it's probably going to be around 10 or something. 7. I kind of like that amount of wobble. So what this wobble is doing right now is it's appearing all around these hot parts of it. I'm going to drag it down so it's mostly in front of the floor areas, sort of affecting them too. Now, the way this turbulent displace works is it has a fractal driving this distortion pattern. It has a center to the turbulence, which is controlled by this offset. So I can grab this little point, and you'll see as I drag it up and down, those ripples are kind of moving along with it. Now a real heat ripple is rising because it's heat. So it should be moving from down to up the whole time. I can create a couple keys that do this or I can also write an expression. Sometimes I just write an expression by adding this to it and saying um, this thing should be at 960 and it should be moving up which is a negative. Um, maybe 500 pixels a second. Let's see what that looks like. So it's a little bit extreme right now. It's a little bit too fast. I'm going to change that to negative 200. I like the idea of you being able to sort of track with your eyes that the ripples are moving upward because that is what a real heat ripple does. That I'm kind of liking. Pretty subtle, but it gives a little bit of an effect. Um, now when these, when the size of this turbulent displace is pretty low, it actually is okay to have this feather up a little bit higher because um, even though you get some double image if you're looking really closely at some of these areas, it's not that bad. And what's kind of nice is that it means that some parts of the image are getting hit really strongly at the bottom, but then the effect sort of fades off toward the top. I'm going to change the complexity of the bubbliness to a little bit higher. You'll see as I turn this up, you get these really crisp, weird looks, kind of watercolory. If the complexity is too high, that's because it's remultiplying the fractal a bunch of times until all of the pixels are getting pushed around and around. Kind of a cool effect if you wanted to do this like watercolor thing, but uh, that's not exactly what we're doing right now. So I'm going to turn the complexity back down. We'll leave it at. See, one was really bubbly and simple. I'm going to turn it to about two. And that's kind of interesting to me. Now let's play that through. There we go. Now we get this heat ripple. It's kind of affecting everything down here. What's nice about the heat ripple, too, is it kind of makes some of the uh, keying and stuff forgivable. But already that uh, the ground looks more hot to me, <laughs> actually, just by seeing that stuff going in there. Now imagine once we add some steam and some fire around here, it's going to work really nicely. And see these glows are making all of my keying efforts really, uh, it's really forgiving to all of my keying efforts because these aren't perfect maps, but they totally work with all this glow and stuff and in motion. You just see that as a result, so that's pretty cool. We're at about the hour mark in this video, so I'm going to go ahead and split it into two parts. Please continue in part two.